friends, as of starting this vlog, I don't have a theme. I'm just reading a couple things and I plan to talk about them to you and we'll see if something emerges. Bibliosophie. <laughs> I started the audiobook for Iris Murdoch's The Sea, The Sea uh, two days ago, mostly listened to it a lot while walking around yesterday in the rain. Um, and I actually mentioned in a previous video that should be posting in like 30 minutes or something, another Iris Murdoch that I picked up a physical copy of, I have to have right here under the net. I'm not reading this one because my uh, Libby loan came in for the C the C, so figured I would listen to it. Uh, I'm really enjoying the uh, narrator. I forgot who does the reading. I'll look that up. Um, and it's a weird book. Uh, we're following basically this retired um, actor slash director. Uh, who has moved to a small town, a uh, country or seaside actually, um, house and is trying to write the story of his life essentially. And he's pompous and definitely a, um, an unreliable narrator in some various ways. We're just stuck in his thought processes and um, I think it's getting more and more obvious that that thought process is not necessarily good all the time. Maybe if there's uh, the beginnings of a theme for this vlog, it's uh, pompous English dudes uh, with thoughts about art uh, imposing themselves upon uh, local populations in small towns because I started uh, Audrey McGee's The Colony. Uh, this was long listed for the Booker Prize and did not make the shortlist, I believe. I actually haven't read any of the long list or shortlist now that was announced yesterday, uh, but I have thoughts. I am unimpressed with what made the shortlist. Unfairly, because again, I haven't actually read any, but the things that I was interested in reading, I think overwhelmingly did not make the shortlist. So I know you came in uh, here to get my deeply uneducated or uh, under knowledgeable thoughts about uh, the current Booker shortlist. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this because I just realized I need to go to class right now. So TBD. cover please. Nice. You know. Some toasties. Hi no name. Happy Friday. We're trying. Uh, I went out of the house well before noon. I took a morning walk. I went over to a friend's for some coffee impromptu. I uh, stole his Ferlinghetti pamphlet. I'm wearing a sweatshirt, which I like. I'm listening to Pato's September playlist on Spotify, which is making me happy. So yeah, I'm gonna go practice, gonna go teach, gonna go rehearse some Ravel. We're trying. actually about probably a little over 500 pages. The audiobook is uh, I think 21 hours. So, you know, it's taking a little while. Uh, after a quite static first section in which um, we're really 
than just introduced to Charles Araby and the protagonist narrator who's writing his memoir by the seaside, um, things really start happening. Uh, and it kind of blurs, to a certain extent, fantasy slash self-delusion and also reality. Um, I'll not go into the plot, I think, too much at all, because I think it's fun and interesting to be surprised by elements of it. Um, but I'll talk more about the book maybe when I've finished it or read more of it. I'm really enjoying it. I also can't stay with it for super extended periods of time. Partially that's because I'm listening to it on audiobook and so I get kind of like a, a stopping point. But also I think it's because of how um, delusional slash dogmatic slash a little peculiar um, the narrator is and also the things happening to him and happening because of him so I kind of need to take breaks from it. Uh, I haven't made much progress with uh, <laughs> the colony since the last time I sat down to talk about it. Um, the night before I last sat down to talk to you I had read about 70 pages and then I just kind of trailed off on other kinds of readings since then, uh, or that in a second. Uh, but I did promise, until I realized that I uh, was going to be late to class, uh, that I would at least introduce what this is about. Um, this takes place on a small island in Ireland. Uh, we are first introduced to one outsider, one Sassana, um, who is a painter. Mr. Lloyd is coming to the island to paint its cliffs, its people, and so he really fancies himself a Gugel. He's going to have a really, really true and, um, uh, what's the word? It's overused constantly. Uh, I cannot find it. But this like special experience of it, um, so he wants to take, for instance, an outdated mode of transportation onto the island. He wants to take this, you know, uh, or this rowboat, uh, but we are now in the uh, late 70s or maybe possibly very early 80s. I think it's in 79. So, you know, there are motorboats, there are new ways. He's not allowing, to a certain extent, the residents of the island to exist as their own selves and also as modern inhabitants. At the point where I stopped, uh, we are just meeting our second outsider, uh, who is actually a French linguist who has been coming to the island for the past few years to uh, get um, a sense of the particular dialect, the particular language on the island, to really, really uh, try to document it. So he's doing a similar thing as well. He is using the resources, the cultural resources of the island for his own personal gain. Uh, in the, I have seen him for just a couple of pages so far really. He seems to have a much less uh, kind of at odds relationship with the locals, probably because he's trying to uh, document the language, uh, so he seems to have a more holistic understanding of the local population, but I suspect that will also be complicated because he's also, you know, trying to extract something from the island in his own right. So I do look forward to continuing this. Sorry, the, the can I, it's the library books with the um, plastified thing, it's hard not to get a total uh, glare. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to reading more of this. I think it's going to be very interesting because it does take place in the either, again, I'm pretty sure it's 1979, but it could be like 1980. We're in the height of a uh, really, really contentious uh, relationship between uh, Ireland and England. Uh, we're in the, the midst of 
the troubles, and so uh, the author also intersperses uh, sh kind of short um, uh, summaries of some IRA attacks and such things, uh, so that you kind of get a sense of the larger context of Ireland within Great Britain, within the British Isles, within the world, uh, and also this kind of tiny island within Ireland, the, the outside geopolitical world kind of encroaching upon this um, kind of out of time uh, island that these two men are trying to milk for, in some ways, their out of time-ness. The other uh, physical book that I've been reading is Patti Smith's Year of the Monkey, and this is very dreamlike. Uh, this is sort of this um, internal fantasia slash outside wanderlust fantasia. You're never really sure what is dream, what is reality. Uh, Patty Smith is kind of wandering around the country, uh, starting from San Francisco at the beginning of the uh, new year, of the solar new year, um, and just and also the beginning of her new year of life because she is born on December 30th. So she's starting in San Francisco. She's just finished off a series of dates at the Fillmore, uh, and she starts wandering kind of to Santa Cruz, to San Diego, hitchhiking, meeting people. Um, then she's back in San Francisco, uh, and it's soon going to be the Lunar New Year, and it's going to be the Year of the Monkey. It's going to be, uh, it's her 70th year, or it's, she is 70, I guess it's her 71st, but you know, depending on how you count uh, years and birthdays. So she's kind of ambivalent about her own begin her own kind of birthday and the her new um, decade of life. Her friend from the 70s is dying and so she is kind of revisiting the past. She's interacting with art and with people, also interacting with art, with literature, um, with objects. Yeah, it's very easy to read in some ways. You just you kind of have to give yourself over into the, the sort of serpentine of it. Um, in some ways, it's not grabbing me, but I will probably finish it. I think this weekend. Uh, it also has pictures, which I always appreciate because she is, uh, Patti Smith is always walking around with a Polaroid, so there are always various pictures to accompany things. I haven't quite coalesced what I think about this book. Um, in some ways, it's also a little um, hermetic and overwhelming, like the sea, the sea. In her personal life, she's she's on the cusp of grieving, or already kind of partially grieving, and she's uh, writing this uh, during in 2016. So it's um, also a very very you know politically charged time, full of pessimism or just hopelessness or just fatigue and you're not completely sure I think she's not completely sure what is just kind of old age setting in what is what's what uh, so in some ways it is it is hard to to deal with uh, actually as I'm talking about it which is kind of the point of a YouTube channel uh, there's a huge parallel with the Murdoch of this constant feeling of ghosts revisiting you. Uh, one is a fictional memoir and one is an actual memoir, but there is, both are actually dealing with um, artists of not a dissimilar age range, and so they're also kind of being revisited by um, 
art's past and also kind of ghosts of their life past. Uh, so it, it kind of all converges together, these two books, in their own ways. Outsiders um, contemplating. Yeah, that's it for now. Okay, I do actually wear real clothes predominantly on a day-to-day -day basis, and sometimes I even wear skirts. In the past week or so, my hair finally reached a length where it flops down instead of just sticking straight up only. Uh, so I think it might be time pretty soon to start using product, and also it means that I officially have long hair. No, I will not be taking any follow-up questions. <laughs> Good morning. I am in a bad mood today. I feel overwhelmed and tired and lazy. Uh, Tuesday is my day off and I have a lot of stuff to take care of. I have to clean up the house if I don't want to. I'm going to the dentist this afternoon. I definitely don't want to. Um, I have to finish some seminar reading for my class tomorrow. I have to write a paper about that meeting. I have to run the program that I'm singing on Friday, and I'm not, today I'm not even excited about that, which is not a good sign. I have to practice and learn other music for other rehearsals and upcoming projects. So, yeah, um, haven't been doing that much reading, needless to say. Jesus, I'm so sorry if you have to. I'm currently transferring some helpful score notations I've made for myself uh, from one score to the one that I'm using for performance. So first of all, I do have a couple of cavities that I'm gonna have to get filled next week. UP. Uh, definitely looking forward to that. And second of all, uh, this is yet another score that I am taking out staging notes from that are no longer applicable because I'm going to prepare this opera again. And I want a, not clean slate, but a slightly cleaner slate uh, for it. So this is the exhilarating shit that uh, goes on behind the scenes. Oh, I'm done. Figured I would check in about my reading progress uh, on the three books. In short, I haven't finished any of them, which is one of the perils of reading several books at once, of course, and also having other shit to do, including other reading for schoolwork. Uh, so I'm making my way relatively slowly. But one of the benefits of reading several books at once is how much I can make connections between books, and I'm definitely grouping all three of them with some similar themes, and especially uh, The Colony and The Sea, The Sea, there are definitely some uh, undercurrents of witnessing and testimony and narrative or uh, narrative supremacy, outsiderness versus insiderness, uh, perception, self delusion, and truth that really, really uh, run in both of those books. Um, and then also to a certain extent in. Uh, Patty Smith's book as well. There's a um, hefty and, in my opinion, very good introduction to my uh, version, to the version of The Sea, The Sea that I'm listening to. I think it's the Penguin Classics version um, by Mary Kinsey, in which one of the major themes that she talks about is the, quote, truth of untruth. 
she uh, brings up a Borges quote about the difference between um, recording events and actually kind of perceiving them. Um, it's from one of his uh, kind of literary essays. Uh, Tacitus did not perceive the crucifixion even if his book recorded it. And uh, that's very, very much what Charles Araby, our protagonist, is doing both in his um, record of what he calls prehistory, so all kind of the introduction of all of these narrative strands prior to the really events of uh, the novel, and then also how he records the, um, uh, the events of the book, he is, as I've said, definitely not a reliable narrator, and he's extremely full of self-delusion, and, and there's a sense in which he just kind of doesn't understand what's going on sometimes. He sometimes willfully misunderstands, sometimes is just sort of missing some crucial uh, perspective probably, and it's not like we know anything that he doesn't because we're stuck entirely in his thoughts, but because we're not hampered by his assumptions, his uh, delusions of grandeur or, or importance or his trauma history, etc., we can sort of see in what ways, uh, even as he's describing events, they're not actually um, what he thinks them to be. And sometimes that's comedic, sometimes it's absolutely horrifying, it gets increasingly horrifying in my opinion. Um, I'm about, I'm now almost two-thirds of the way through the book, and whew, some some things are really fucking hard. It's, uh, it, it remains funny, actually, in some ways to me, but we're dealing with some abuse and, and um, really toxic relationships and uh, really toxic people. Also, Murdoch doesn't just create Araby as this lone pocket of self-delusion. There's many ways in which the other characters and even just the plot of the book come to meet him. Uh, the ways in which things get heightened, the ways in which improbabilities do occur, and, and then also in the ways that other people exhibit some pretty massively self-deluded uh, traits means that it's not just our, our narrator who is this lone pocket of pompous ridiculousness. Uh, he is very much uh, shadowed and mirrored by the other people in the book uh, that he interacts with or that he has interacted with in his past. Um, so it, it's very, very interesting. Uh, I don't know how frustrating it is for you that I remain pretty steadfast and not wanting to give you any plot details, but there are some ways in which this is like a kind of ghost story, and I, I kind of enjoyed not knowing what was going to happen. And the way that the first section is set up you're really not sure, or I wasn't sure because I didn't know anything, um, I wasn't sure where it was going to go even tonally, so I'm uh, attempting to recreate this for you. I definitely recommend the book. I'm glad I'm finally getting, I mean, this is a famous book by a famous author, uh, much acclaimed. Uh, I'm glad I'm finally getting into Murdoch and uh, finally reading this book. Uh, Apropos of The Colony, I'm about halfway through. It's a very fast read when I actually sit down to read it. Um, as I assumed last time I talked to you briefly, our French linguist, uh, Masson, 
definitely also has a, in my view, and probably in everybody else's view, complicated um, relationship to the island, to the people of the island, and to his task at hand, uh, because he he is a man with an agenda, as I said. Uh, he wants to record Irish, um, which is a dying language at this point, and he he's not just observing. He's not just witnessing the island and its inhabitants um, from you know a uh, an outside perspective. He is deeply enmeshed with an agenda to make the, the Irish language survive, no matter what he can do. He has a, um, an, an interaction with uh, Lloyd, the painter, in which Lloyd sort of says, aren't you supposed to, as a linguist, just observe and describe rather than have a working hand in uh, the environment? And Masson disagrees, he says, no, I, you know, this is this this is an emergent situation. I want to help save this language. Um, he has a sort of not even semi-exaggerated desire to uh, put the island under glass and forbid English being spoken on the island because uh, he has a very very real um, desire to not let. English erode at the the remaining Irish speaking that is being preserved. And part of that is not just understandable, but even noble. That is, there is a way in which um, cultural uh, preservation can't just be kind of uh, passive. It, it often, as we see, requires like very, very active work. And in some ways exclusion, but also does he get to make that call? It, so it's, it is very, very complicated. There's a short exchange between uh, Masson, who's called JP on the island. I forgot if his name is Jean-Paul or Jean-Pierre. I think it's Jean-Pierre, one of those extremely French names. Uh, between him and another character we've seen a lot throughout the book, um, one of the only young people on the island, James has already had a lot of interaction with the painter. And at one point, Masson um, just says, you know, hi, how, how are you doing when he arrives? But he calls him Seamus. To which uh, James or Seamus responds, my name is James and you know that. Your Irish name is Seamus. I use my English name. I prefer the Irish. It's not your choice, JP. And I think that is a really, really good encapsulation of uh, one of the arguments, one of one of the sticky points of the book. Who does get to decide these things? Um, and I'll leave off for now, at least, with one last little proof of ligament uh, between the two books and uh, delusion, illusion, self-delusion, and truth being such a major concern, uh, the very opening of the colony, I was very interested to note is a Nietzsche quote, which is, truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that this is what they are. As always, completely unable to sit like a normal, regular person, just with my two feet on the ground. Okay, the concept is that I'm wrapping up this vlog right now, but I, my brain is kind of mushy and I don't know what to say. I don't have the courage. Uh, some final thoughts. I am not done with the colony yet. I have a little over 100 pages left. I have really enjoyed the book so far, and I suspect I'm going to enjoy it until the end. If I don't, I'll let you know in a September wrap-up or something. There'll be an edition, so I definitely recommend that book. Um, the tension is not so much overtly rising, but more and more situations are coming up that 
kind of could lead to increased tension. We keep having conversations between Masson and Lloyd um, about kind of who gets top dog billing on the island, who has the right conception of the island, and then of course uh, between the various actual inhabitants thereof. Uh, the author is also kind of heightening the tension by adding more frequent um, incursions from the outside world. She has inc an increasing number of uh, reports of um, Protestant Catholic uh, murders and so we're getting by virtue of that kind of a heightened sense of things going wrong. Uh, there's an in interesting character point to Masson that didn't surprise me greatly. Um, he is the son of a French soldier and an Algerian woman, so he, part of the reason why he takes um, such a stance against a colonizing language is that it is, it is very much part of who he is as well. So, minor spoiler alert. Um, yeah, it's, it's full of these um, complicated characters who are interacting in ways that I really like. So I'll finish it off, but I'm really glad that I read it. Uh, I finished Year of the Monk. What's my light doing? Soon we will have sunset. I finished The Sea the Sea last night, actually. I was a little farther along than I thought, and I finished it. Uh, I really liked it as well. Um, I'm not going to talk more about it, because I, I already gave you enough spiel. Uh, I'll mention again just how much ghosts recur, how important they are. Uh, in some ways, I felt like a little um, attacked, I guess, like wondering if I too suffer from the same kinds of delusions and kind of self-imposed traumas and ghosts as the characters in the book do, and I think I do, because I think we kind of all do. And we... It reminds me that ambiguous loss metastasizes into ghosts, even if that ambiguous loss is largely born out of self-delusion. And speaking of ghosts, I finished Year of the Monkey. Uh, I have to admit that I did so sort of nebulously. Part of that is my fault. I think I wasn't reading super, super closely, but also that's that's the book's doing. It's not entirely my fault. Uh, it's hard to tell what's dream, what's thought process, what's memory, what's a combo of all of the above. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a um, loosey-goosey ride in some ways. Do I recommend it? If you like Patti Smith, uh, it's, it's more nebulous than Just Kids, which is the only book of hers that I've read previously. Um, there's a sort of deep discomfort and sadness that runs throughout the book, as I've mentioned before, and so, so, so many ghosts. I mean, she herself is almost like a ghost in some ways because she she's kind of floating around visiting things and people, but she is, of course, haunted by other ghosts. Uh, still, it's not overwhelmingly uh, ambivalent or sinister or uh, pessimistic. She loses several friends over the course of this year and she is grappling with the um, political moment, with the future, the future of the planet, ecologically, her own future as an aging body. Uh, but she still maintains some amount of hope, which she um, encapsulates pretty well the kind of hope that it is in her epilogue of sorts. Sam is dead, this is Sam Shepard. My brother is dead, my mother is dead, my father is dead, 
my husband is dead, my cat is dead, and my dog who was dead in 1957 is still dead. Yet still I keep thinking that something wonderful is about to happen, maybe tomorrow. A tomorrow following a whole succession of tomorrows. But getting back to the moment, which is already gone, I was alone in Virginia Beach, suddenly left holding the bag. So yeah, I don't have massively um, deep ties or thoughts about Year of the Monkey. I think it has its definite merits. Um, even though it actually took me a while to read because I just kind of wasn't reading it, it is a very fast read. It will make you want coffee. Okay, that's all she wrote or spoke, I guess. Till next.